1997, uh, the year when at least most of the senior students over here were born, I had my first ever visit to a psychiatrist. I was diagnosed with major depressive disorder uh, back then, and I just about mustered up the courage to come out to my parents about uh, you know what I was feeling and what I was going through since the age of about 10. And I was about 18 then. Um, now, when I got to my 20s, uh, I thought I was quite sorted, and you usually are when you're in your 20s. You know, you've got me your first jobs, you think you know everything about everything, and uh, uh, you know, if you, you're able to do just the basic things. You can juggle your moods, even if you do have depression, it's much easier for you to uh, handle it because in you know, a lot of situations, you just, you know, you're physically much stronger. And you're able to do a lot of things. You can, you know, party the whole night and get home at five in the morning, and somehow with the hangover magic jacket, self out of bed at, uh, you know, eight in the morning and make it to work. Uh, so that's basically how my, uh, you know, how my twenties. Oh yeah, so that was me. There's two uh, phases in my life. So one was before balls and one was after balls. And after balls. I think uh, what happens when you're in your 20s is, uh, you know, you just want a job that pays you for what you've been trained to do. That's about it. You, 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 you've been trained to be a filmmaker. You just want to make films and get paid for it. That's pretty much it. You will do a lot of free work. You will do a lot of assistant uh, work. But you just want to get paid for it. But by the time you reach your 30s, at least when I reached my 30s, I realized I wasn't making the kind of films that I wanted. I was working with conglomerates. I was doing a lot of corporate work. And I wasn't telling stories. That was something that I wanted to do. Um, so, apart from the fact that I, I was diagnosed with depression, I was diagnosed with uh, schizophrenia, I was diagnosed with schizophrenia after that at the age of 24, and I was then diagnosed with bipolar disorder by the time I was uh, 28, and after two suicide attempts, which, you know, I've survived, as you can see. Uh, so, I, uh, I realized that it wasn't, you know, life wasn't working for me, and, you know, it wasn't just about the illness, it was in every way, and I decided, you know, I was doing really well. My company was doing really well. I was on the threshold of being one of the biggest uh, media companies in the country. We had the top conglomerates in India working with us. We were working with Unity, we were working with Yahoo, we were working with Microsoft Connect, Maxima, Mandy of Life Insurance, uh, Nokia UK. Uh, and I just stopped one day. I just said I can't do this. I shut my company down at this point. And I left. I, and actually, it wasn't really because of the mental illness or anything. That was the reason that everybody else leaves. It's uh, because you think there's a higher purpose. You think that you want to figure something out in life. You think that uh, uh, you know there's this magic thing out there, and you go on that trip like Steve Jobs did, and you come back and find found Apple. Uh, that 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 was pretty much why I left. It was because everyone else does it. You see people's Facebook pictures and. You know, everyone's lives are perfect. They're in the mountains, they're meditating with the yogi, they're smoking up with someone else. And it's just the most amazing things that people tell you when they come back from the trips. And, you know, like, I do go to the mountains. You know, I wrote an entry in here. And that's why I left. I didn't really, you know, did it for those reasons. I'm nothing to do with the illness. That's me pulling rope somewhere in South India. And one of those tiny fishing nets in Cochin. But I did a lot of fun things. I did a lot of fun things on this trip. And it was really eye-opening. It was uh, two years where I just put out a status every time I wanted to keep a place and say, hey, looking for a place to crash in so-and-so place that I decided to go to. And I just traveled around. So I ended up working for a hotel school, doing social media for them. I ended up teaching at a school. I ended up designing posters, websites, and things like that for really small shops in the Middle East that would then bring them into the age of online uh, uh, you know, transactions and order your groceries, etc. online. And then I decided to come back to Bombay once I was done over those two years. And I came back to Bombay and I realized I just, I wasn't relevant anymore over here. Uh, I didn't make the same kinds of terms that people wanted. I had lost out on a lot. I, uh, my relationship was going really badly. Uh, I couldn't get a job. Same clients that, you know, at some point in time I didn't have time for. Uh, they found someone that was younger and better. And, and that, with my moods and with my mood disorder, really led to a breakdown in 2014. So I was I was found somewhere, I don't know how many of you know Bombay, but I did in Bangra and I was found in Burundi. I walked all the way there. I had cut myself and there was 10 meters of blood on the floor around me. 
I just got out. I, you could see my bone literally through the cuffs, right? I mean, it was a serrated knife and it was really deep. I was found walking around and people saw me and they didn't think that I was someone like who was a street dweller or, or, or you, they, they thought I was someone that was from, uh, you know, certain strata of society and they called the cops and stuff like that. And I was very disoriented. And I was just walking around and that was when my parents decided that they were going to put me in an institution which I think was a great thing because it was the first time in 25 years that I lived, I had lived. And 20 years that I've been diagnosed with mental illness that I was actually getting psychiatric care. And uh, so I was given electroconvulsive therapy in the hospital and you know, one of the side effects is memory loss. You can't remember things, you get that to great am amnesia. To a certain extent, there are things that I don't remember from 2014 even today because that I've met. Uh, that I don't remember today, but that's great because I don't remember how my previous relationship ended, which is always nice. <laughs> and so, um, so I did that and I got out, and now I was like, okay, so an open secret, everyone knows about it, and may as well now start talking about it. You know, previously they put you in regular hospitals, it's easier to explain it to the world that he's sick, he's not well, but now once he's in an institution, you might as well start talking about it. So I started talking about it working in mental health for the last few years. I researched a lot about my own problems, but I also started meeting people who had uh, the same illness as me and other sorts of illnesses. So I'm, by the way, 25, I was diagnosed with borderline personality disorder, so that's my post diagnosis in life. So uh, I started talking to other people, and now you probably must be wondering, you know, with all of this stuff, I mean, a lot of you know that you can go on to Google and you can just, you know, look it up. But, you know, why does it make a difference to you? And it actually, you know, sorry, it actually does, right? Why should we care? Because it is estimated by the WHO that by 2025, 20% of India's population will suffer from a mental illness. That's 20%. Uh, it's huge. If you look around you, the person to your left, the person to your right, I mean, you don't have to do it, but uh, the, one, the person behind you, the person in front of you, it's it's one of these people and uh might be you and by 2025 some of the older ones of you will be approaching 30 the age that i did when i uh realized i couldn't handle it anymore and that's eight years from now maybe nine years from now eight years from now and you're not going to be able to afford it you're not going to be able to your lives are going to be ruined your relationships are not going to go in the way that you want to, your careers are probably not going to, there's going to be a lot of competition, social media, everything. You're not going to be able to afford it, it's about 1,500 to 3,000 rupees to go to uh, a psychiatrist for one uh, setting, unless you live in a small town or a village or uh, something smaller than Vizag, but even Vizag, you're going to end up spending a thousand bucks every time you go, and you've got to go once in a week because you're taking medication every for a week, and your medication is stamped. Uh, so that you know you don't overdose on it, you're giving fully a certain uh, count of it. So yeah, yeah. So I mean, every week you're gonna have to spend that thousand rupees apart from the medication costs. So that's and that's apart from any other treatment. And this is not just for people who go through severe mental illness. This is for everyone who goes in to get antidepressants. Um, so and small towns and villages are not even going to talk about it because I've done this trip. I have cycled all the way from Bombay to Goa, Goa to Cochin, Cochin to Bangalore, through small towns and villages, just looking to tell stories and trying to find out what is the situation as far as mental health is concerned in these small towns and villages. And there's nothing. From Bombay to Ratnagiri, 500 kilometers, there's no mental health facilities, there are no health facilities in most villages. 70 villages will have to travel about. 150 to 200 kilometers to go to that first OB. That's literally if you have an accident or you have a problem with childbirth, you have to travel 150 kilometers by the time you're there. Okay. Uh, this is the situation. And mental health, even less. So uh, I noticed that different states had different problems. They had different uh, policies, they had different ways of dealing with it. Some states were better off, but not about better off than Maharashtra, was better off than Kerala, was better off than. Uh, uh, you know, then, then Goa. Goa was actually not, not all that bad. So Goa and Karnataka were on the same uh, same level as far as mental health is concerned. So you're probably wondering, you know, are we doomed? I mean, uh, what do we do? Is there anyone that's going to do something? Can we do something about ourselves? 
should I panic now? And you, I don't know about panicking, but the only way we can prepare for this is we can prepare for this by being, uh, you know, by taking action in advance to realize that we might be one of these people, your kids might be one of these people. You invest in insurance, not knowing whether they're going to have that actual or not. Uh, whether you're going to have that operation or not. And why, why don't we do this with my uh, We don't assume that our own children, because parents would mostly blame themselves and say that there's something wrong with my own upbringing that my child is doing. You know, have I not done enough? When she wanted a, 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 a laptop, I got her a Mac. When she wanted this, I got her that. I always gave her the best. And, you know, that's the way most people think. Uh, right now, so you need to plan about the uh, plan the one, but you also need to understand yourself as a person. And this is the biggest cliche ever. People tell me, oh, it's all about understanding yourself. But truly, yes, you do. You need to understand what triggers you, what are ways in which you can curb it. Because by the end of it, when people romanticize your business or your profession, or call it your dark cloud over your blue sea, they will be like, no, that's an illness. It's something that I need to take care of. Should be romanticized, it's not to be romanticized. So, I've sort of like these are not going to work for everyone, uh, they could be uh, repeated, but these are just the way that I handle my mental So, and by the way, this is me introducing someone in a small town. I'm going to take, take two, four more trips. I'm going up to Chandigarh in 15 days from Bombay cycling again. I think cycling is a great way to do it uh, because you get to see a beach of the country. Bombay to Goa, literally overnight, you haven't seen anything here in Goa, but it took me 10 days to get to go on. So, um, so it's sort of a survival manual in 2017. Uh, so, number one, I'm not a problem, but I might actually be part of it. You know, a lot of us, I'm not blaming people with mental illness over here that they are responsible somehow for the way that they feel. But yes, we are part of it. And I'll start with a small little story. When I was uh, when I was younger and my parents got divorced, I did not know whether it was a good thing or a bad thing to get divorced. I was told by people around me, like, oh, it's from a broken home. You must be really sad. You know, a lot of things must be happening. Then I said, how oh, managed to do this? You know, something, yes, something is happening to me. Uh, you know, I have this feeling like a really bad deal against my parents, I'm in pain, everyone's in pain. And I started blaming my parents. Consequently, I started getting stuff for free from them. I mean, you know, every time I needed some money, I tell my dad, you're a really bad dad, how could you leave us and go? And I did a lot of these things, and a lot of us tend to do that. And uh, I was told over and over again in the airport that, you know, there was something wrong with me. And because mostly children from Devon turn out a certain way, I would turn out a certain way, and that's exactly what happened. So I actually believe that our habits and our learnings are what makes us the way that we are. So if you talk about mental illness in terms of chemical balance, or if you talk in, uh, in, in terms of things that happen in your life that have led you to feel a certain way, to a certain disorder, uh, that's fine. I don't know what I have with my parents when I was never diagnosed, and then their generation never got diagnosed. So, but I chanced upon something called neuroplasticity, uh, which is a research currently being conducted that the brain doesn't stop developing after a certain point. It continues to develop, so it's not like adults can't learn new things. They may be less receptive to attention, but you can always change things. And this is actually physical change in the brain. So, uh, if you use a certain part of your brain, you excite it a lot more. So, people who are used to doing things where they're learning things by heart or they have to remember uh, a lot of data, then use certain part, parts of the brain. So, now there are three ways in which your brain, the structure of your brain actually changes. Uh, you know, the first one being. Uh, Chemicals. So you're you're gonna fire off electrical signals every time someone touches you when you're learning a new thing uh, or whatever. You it's chemical uh, and electrical signals that go between neurons and then you know uh, cause a certain change in the brain. There's structure which takes a, uh, which is more long term, where the structure of your brain changes after you using it in a certain way. And of course, there's function depending on you know uh, what you use your brain for. So this was like one of the best things that happened to me because I understood that a lot of things. And there's some hope, there's some scientific uh, basis to which I can at least help myself. So I started doing different things, and last year I started cycling. And I realized that cycling did amazing things for me. I, uh, I would get sleep because I would cycle, and, and then you, when you're with hypomania, 
you will have a lot of energy. I will cycle for 100 kilometers every single night. Now that's a lot, that's five, five to six hours of cycle. And I wasn't getting sleep in the night, so I said I might as well do it. So I said, I'll just sit for 10 minutes. I, I started doing that, my sleep habits uh, changed. And a lot of mental illness will have insomnia. That's one of the, you know, one of the side effects of it. Don't get sleep in the morning. I was getting sleep immediately. As soon as I got home, 100 kilometers, I would be out. My eating habits changed. And I realized I could just keep doing this. And this was probably a part of my brain that I was I hadn't excited before. And I could feel it. I could feel myself getting better. I could feel myself a bit smarter in things. I was uh, cycling doing a monotonous activity. You feel a lot better. You think your phone is not on. You're just cycling. So all you're doing is cycling. And you can get angry. You can take it out of the bed. You can go faster. You can get slow. But by the time you come back, you can it out of all your problems. So, that was one 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 thing actually to to realize that things can change uh, physically for you. It's not just a mental thing. It's not just a chemical thing. Uh, the second is no one can live without someone or something else. This is something I tell a lot of people, at least who are in codependent relationships. So a lot of us with depression and bipolar disorder tend to get into codependent relationships. So I I actually think that one should fall in love with something apart from a human or anything that it is. So it's very important to fall in love with whether it's something that you do is, you know, because that's the one thing that's going to sort you out on those days that that person is. So if I'm out on my cycle, my cycle is not going to turn on and tell me that I'm not worthy and I'm not good and I'm bad. I know that everything, whether I, I fall down or whether something comes loose or whether something, um, I'm tired or there's an uphill and I can't do it, it's me and it's not the cycle. And it's important to do this process. Of course, the third is understanding that society rewards uh, strength, but as uh, not because at its best it rewards strength, uh, but as worst weakness. So that means that a lot of times uh, your uh, your the people around you are most responsible for. Uh, the people around you are most responsible for uh, making you feel the way that you do. So if you've got a mental illness, a lot of times people around me have found a few of the mental illness in a certain way. I had uh, newspapers and magazines come up to me and tell me, uh, so what is your experience with things? And I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about villages. I want to talk about small towns. And I was literally told that, uh, no, we just want to hear about your experience with it. Constant reminders over and over there. I, I did uh, stand-up comedy and poetry, but I continuously got triggered with all of this stuff over and over again because after a while either it triggers you because you're learned over and over again or you have to uh, or you feel you're not doing a good job you're 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 not um, you know you're not uh, faithful to the topic anymore because if you're doing it over and over again you don't feel the same way anymore so that's uh, one to understand that society does that and you have to take your own uh, decision it do those around you this is very important because people around you who uh, uh, who don't agree with you, it's very important to include those people in it. When we, when we sit with people who are constantly telling us, yes, you're really mental illness is a thing, we're really uh, concerned about it, you're whatever, you're sitting in an echo chamber. But when my father, for example, and his generation doesn't understand what my father says, mental illness is a thing, everything is about you not waking up on time. You know, the tsunami that happens somewhere else again because you do not wake up at 6 in the morning. And you don't have uh, discipline. Uh, so, sit down and talk to them. I, I know when a person says mental illness is not a thing, uh, I ask them, okay, you think it's not a thing, let's sit down. So a young child who commits suicide in the world is six years old, and the youngest child in India who commits suicide is eight years old. Do they have credit card problems? Do they have funding for their business problems? Do they have relationship problems? I think not. And I somehow managed to include them, because otherwise it's been an echo chamber. And people, uh, people who just agree with you don't take you in. Their change is when people who don't agree with you start seeing things the way that you are. Uh, the way that you present it. So that's that. To rate your thinking process, and this is a lot, a lot about social media. Now, I'm not telling you to get off social media, that's kind of like, because you need it for every job and uh, everything that you're doing. You need a lot of social media. So, but to rate it. Like for me, I've realized Instagram works really, really, really well for me. Uh, because it's just pictures, but Facebook didn't. Facebook was bringing out every single anger, jealousy, everything that would possibly trigger me. That was on my list that I did not even like, and I don't know why they were trying to. 
There were people whose progress I was actually not very happy with. I wanted to just play with them. And that was seven years of Gen Z too. So I think it's really important to be social media wise because uh, I think that this could be one of the reasons that there's so much information being bombarded with that uh, people in, in, uh, in a few years are going to be much more depressed and are going to be feeling much more than they do right now. And finally, seek professional help if you can. Uh, a lot of people don't. A lot of people believe that uh, I have gone through religious that people actually believe that their child is a certain way because they committed one of ten sins in their past life and they don't, they, they don't get the help that they need. Um, so it's not only about, uh, it's not only about Western medicine being legal, but it's also the fact that uh, a lot of us are scared, a lot of us are scared to get the technical compulsive therapy, for example. I'm not getting to come to therapy and I can share an article the other day when someone comes up and someone says, people are being subjected to this being human practice and I was like, it's actually a very human disease. And it's not all that bad, you know, people possibly relax and think and all of that. And said, but then why do they go to small towns and do it to poor people? And I was like, they don't actually, that's the problem in India. There are no mental health treatment in India. So it's an expensive process. It's uh, a time consuming process, and no, it doesn't make me think that because I've been to small towns and I can tell you that you seek mental health, uh, mental health uh, and professional health as much as you can because it could possibly be the best thing that you've ever done. And to end this, uh, I would like to end with a quote uh, Richard Feynman, uh, the father of quantum theory, once said, If you need to understand quantum theory, you probably don't. And I think it's the same with mental health. If you need to understand mental health, you probably don't. Don't because the more I learn about it, the more I realize I know nothing, and the more I experience it, I realize I know nothing. Thank you.